Hi, welcome to the August Board Wrap-Up Show with Superintendent Dr. Pennington. School begins coming up very soon. In fact, that's a great place to start our show. Dr. Pennington, as uh, we record our program today, school is set to begin for all of the Ponca City Public Schools. It's August 17th is our first day, and that's a Wednesday. And uh, obviously, if, if people... You know, you can you kind of know when school's getting ready to start just because all of a sudden you see uh, teacher cars in the parking lot as they're getting their classes ready. Uh, we have a, a you know a week or so of, of parents uh, going to school and enrolling. There's just a lot more activity uh, around our school sites, and and it's always important for our viewers to remember that that uh, you know if, depending upon where you travel. Uh, for instance, you know, you don't want to drive uh, down Highland between uh, 14th Street and 5th Avenue from about uh, 745 to 845 every morning because it's just packed with, with parents who are taking their children to Roosevelt or students who are going to the high school. And now that we've opened the pre-K center at Washington, that building, which has been open the last two years, uh, will now be once again a functioning school site. So that particular area of town is always very crowded. And then, uh, of course, anybody that's ever been on the um, west side of Grand Avenue at, when, uh, at the beginning or end of the school day because of Lincoln and West know how congested that is. So, and that kind of happens every part of town for a, really, a, you think about the, you know, how many hours are already in a, in a work day. It's a very small part of the day. But just remember, and also remember that, that that means that we're gonna have students who are walking to school and riding bikes. And uh, as much as we would like, especially those elementary age students to, you know, to be careful and to pay attention and follow safety rules, reality is they're kids. And uh, sometimes they do kid things. And as adults, we just have to always be aware of them. A Couple of exciting things as we begin the 16-17 calendar school year. Obviously the school zones are probably the most important thing, but Trout Elementary opens back up and uh, you mentioned the pre-K center. So those are just two of the buildings that uh, will be occupied this year. You know, we've done uh, lots of, we've had lots of projects this summer and uh, anybody that has driven down uh, Grand Avenue in the last month has noticed the new windows we've put on at East and the way that that building, you wouldn't think that, that replacing windows would have such a dramatic effect on the appearance of the building. But you know, it really has uh, changed the way East Middle School looks. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's an institutional building. I mean, it was, that building was built in the late 20s and it just has that institutional look that schools had that were built back then. Uh, but you know, with these new windows we have, it's, and it's kind of brightened the building up uh, we painted the doors on the outside to match the window trim, and it just really has dressed up that facility. So we're really excited about that. We had a major renovation project at Lincoln Elementary. We moved the office to the front of the building, and we built, uh, took the existing space that was there where the office used to be and renovated it. And obviously we mentioned Trout. Trout had been shut down for a year because in addition to moving the office and renovating the office areas, we also added new classrooms to Trout so that we've gotten rid of the portable buildings that have been there for, I don't even know, a lot longer than I've been here. So we're really excited about that. And, uh, and uh, we're actually going to have two open houses on uh, Sunday, uh, uh, August 21st from two to 4 p.m. There will be an open house at Trout and an open house at Lincoln so people can go and kind of look at, at the dramatic changes that have been made. We also did some work at Liberty. Uh, it was not, the office at Liberty was already in the front of the building, so we just had to create the secure entrance there. And we've done the same thing at, at Roosevelt. We've created a secure entrance there. It's not as dramatic as the changes that took place at, uh, at Trout and at, and at Lincoln. So we're excited. This is, you know, your bond issue money at work. Um, the other part thing that's pretty exciting, Phil, is we're getting closer and closer to the final design for the, uh, the press box, the football locker room, and the weight room improvements to our athletic facilities. And we're also getting closer to the final design on the concert hall. So we really have, uh, and those were really, those were really the big uh, projects in this last bond issue. So we're excited about uh, things that are getting ready to happen. And, and really this, you know, as we get after football season this year, you're gonna see lots of activity 
construction activity around the high school. Now, that in itself will be in, will cause some inconveniences. We know that, but we think when it's all said and done, our patrons are really going to be happy uh, with the uh, improvements we've made to our facilities. Well, with the uh, timetable of the Hutchins uh, coming down probably in, in late October, in November, uh, does it look like spring they'll start that project? Well, we hope to start construction, probably, we, we hope to bid the project uh, in December. And so then, uh, you know, it's just a matter of, after that, there's about a 30 day time period from the time that bids are open to they actually start pro construction. We could probably start in February. Of course, what you don't ever know you're gonna deal with is weather, uh, especially in North Central Oklahoma. I mean, last winter, uh, we could have built facility, we wouldn't have had to stop for anything. I mean, we never, really never had any bad days that would have delayed construction. Um, when you're uh, when you talk about starting in February, March, and you're talking about you know the it, the winter and the spring, and you know you just you just don't know what you're going into. And I, I tell you, this year with all the with all the rain we've had in July and August, I mean, who would ever have thought that uh, that you'd be dealing? I mean, we didn't have any outside construction going on, but if you were trying to build a building this summer, you'd be, you'd be pretty far behind schedule because of the rain we've had. So, you know, you just don't know. Absolutely. Uh, a couple of things that we wanted to talk about about the board meeting. Uh, you wanted to update patrons on our funding as we head into the 16-17 calendar school year. Right. Uh, you know, last year we talked about funding a lot. And, uh, and I'm sure people, uh, you know, probably got tired of me talking about it on every show, it seemed like. So I want to let people know where we are. Uh, we have received our initial state aid allocation for the 16-17 school year. Uh, it is less than uh, the allocation we received for the 15-16 school year, but it's better than what we ended 15-16 with. Um, so, uh, you know, in the neighborhood of, oh, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, we finished the year, we, uh, when, you, when everything was, was, was done and we, had been actually got another budget cut at the end of June. We ended up with uh, with from all sources of revenue, we received about a million dollars less last year than we were supposed to receive. Um, so we've lost a million. Right now we've gained two hundred thousand. Uh, we've made uh, enough staffing cuts to uh, to accommodate uh, the state aid uh, revenue loss that that we've received. We have about, you know, I mentioned that we, from what we lost last, lost last year to where we are this year, overall, our budget is right at $700,000 less than it was this time last year. So, uh, that being said, because of the cuts, uh, the hiring freezes that we put in place uh, in January, uh, and uh, because of some, some spending cuts we made, or we, we you know, we, we, we cut, a minute, cut budgets to the building, and basically, we just kind of froze everything in place where it was. We've entered this year, we think, in a solid financial position. Um, I don't think anybody knows whether the state budget uh, that was passed is gonna last or not. Um, we just saw the revenue numbers for July, and once again, state revenues were down. I think this is 17 straight months that we've collected less than we did the year before the same month. So things are not better in Oklahoma, even though you hear things about you know, maybe school funding is this, or this has happened, or that's happened. The reality is uh, we continue to still be in a recession as a state. I don't know at what point it becomes a depression, uh, but that's where we are. Uh, there's a couple of things the legislature did in appropriating money to put more money into the general fund of schools that you know, kind of give us money on one hand and take it out in the other. The biggest area was textbook funding. We receive textbook funding every year, and those are funds that are earmarked for textbooks. Um, and last this year, for 16-17, they, they did not allocate any money to the State Department for textbooks. Instead, they put that money that had been going into textbooks and put it into uh, the uh, state aid formula. So uh, while obviously on one hand it's, it's good to have more state aid money, on the other hand, if you don't have textbook money, you're gonna be spending some of your state aid allocation 
to help buy textbooks or you're just not going to buy textbooks. Uh, this happens to be a, a, a big adoption this year. It's mathematics. And the other danger in that is that if you, if you miss a cycle, then, you know, then it could be seven more years before you come back and buy textbooks again. And especially with the new standards, we, I mean, I mean, you know, the legislature had to make some tough decisions. I understand that. Um, but, uh, but that was, a that's one of those kind of things that, you know, um, you just kind of can't let that one slide. So that's, so that's kind of what's going on with funding. Uh, we were able to give all of our uh, teachers and support personnel a step increase. And so what does that mean? Well, we have a salary schedule. And uh, so each year, everyone uh, earns more money than they did the year before as they move down the salary schedule. It's not a cost of living increase. Uh, our, our steps are, uh, you know, have been in the teacher side have been negotiated uh, on the support side they've been in place for a long time and, and that, but they're not, you know, uh, we don't go in and, and say, well, the cost of living has gone up 2%, so you're going to get a 2% step increase. It didn't work that way. Um, probably if you look at it, it probably averaged about a percent and a half per person's where it comes in. So once again, because we haven't had a significant funding increase for schools in the state of Oklahoma, um, the earning power of our teachers and our support staff uh, has definitely not kept up with inflation, and, and make, which makes it harder for us to find teachers, makes it harder for us to find assistants and custodians and maintenance workers and all those kinds of things. So, you know, we, 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 we kind of keep digging ourselves a hole in Oklahoma, and, uh, you know, I don't, Phil, I don't know what's going to take to change it. You hear a lot in the in the news uh, in Oklahoma City and Tulsa mainly because that's where uh, a lot of the information is out of uh, regarding uh, teacher bonuses or stipends or five thousand dollars. The numbers, nothing really solid though, is there on that? No, there's not. Uh, you know, the the hope we have, and it and it really is the only thing that's out there right now. And that is the one set sales tax that's going to be on the ballot in November. I think it's state question 779. And that would create a new permanent funding stream for Oklahoma schools. Um, obviously, as we get closer to the election, we'll probably talk about it more. You know, there if you if you if you listen, there are basically it kind of seems like there's two arguments out there. One argument is, and uh, which is uh, this is very concerning for cities because the city relies upon the sales tax and their concern is that if we add a, a penny to our sales tax and that sales tax is devoted to schools or voted to the state because it becomes a statewide tax, then as a, then as a city, I don't have the flexibility to go in and ask my voters for a sales tax to do something, whatever that something may be. And that's a legitimate concern because our cities operate on sales tax. They're also concerned that our sales tax would get to be so high that it would put us at a disadvantage to other areas. For example, you know, people from Arc City, I don't know what the sales tax is in Kansas, but you know, there may be a point where either people from Arc City would not come to Ponca City to buy things, or people from Ponca City might drive to Arc City to buy things because the sales tax is cheaper. Uh, the big issue is the internet and the fact that uh, if you buy from Amazon um, and some of those other that do not have a presence in the st physical presence in the state of Oklahoma, then they don't collect sales tax, and that's becoming more and more widespread as as the internet uh, is able to customize shopping, and you can do it from your home rather than going you know out to shop somewhere. You know, I don't know how big that's going to be. I mean, it's, it's growing every year, but to some extent, shopping is a social activity. You know, people go shopping together. And you can't replicate that online, so I think I think there's probably a point out there where it kind of peaks, but it is a problem, and so uh, and so those concerns are legitimate. Uh, Kansas just last year had a passed a big passed a one cent sales tax increase, that was to fund general operations for the state of Kansas because they've cut their income tax so much that the state was broke, and uh, and so that's that's where they are. Texas has always had a high sales tax because they don't have a state income tax. So, you know, I don't know at the end of the day where that all lays out. What I know is this, is that uh, we've been, I think Governor Boren 
President Bourne launched his initiative uh, sometime last fall. And so we had a legislative session where the legislature had the opportunity to come up with another plan. And we've had a summer for someone to come up with another plan that they could present to the people and say, look, this is what, we, this is what we're committed that we're going to do. The governor has, a ch- has had a chance to come up with another plan. You know, she could, she could have brought state leaders in. They could have sat down and they could have said, look, we've got a three, four, five-point plan that next session that we're going to enact to make sure that we stop the hemorrhaging of teachers across state lines or that will encourage more young people to become teachers. Because right now, you know, the issue is not just people who leave Oklahoma, but it's the people who don't go into education anymore when they go to college because they look at it and they don't see, they just don't, they don't see that it's, that it's worthwhile to them. And look, Teachers have always known when you become when you decide to when you decide to become an educator, you know that you're not going to make as much money as, and you can fill that blank. And you're not going as a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, um, you know, other professions. But the gap was not as large as it is now. Uh, you know, when I made that decision 40 years ago, um, I could look at uh, maybe what somebody was making as a uh, as, as somebody as a, as a as a banker, you know, or an insurance salesman, and you know, I could look I could look at that and I could make an informed decision that yes, I'll make a little bit less money, but I'm going to get to do what I really want to do, which for me I was going to get to coach. That's what I wanted to be a coach, and so for me that's what I got to do, and so it was worth that trade off, and I could sit down and have a plan that I could do some things by working in the summer, maybe starting a little business, selling real estate. I could do some things in the summer that would that would kind of bridge that gap a little bit uh, for my family and I. Uh, but today you can't do that because the gap is so large that you can't make that up in a summer um, doing something else. And so people, are, young people are making other decisions. And I don't think any of us blame them for that. I think we all want all of our children to go to school, get a college degree in something they want to do, something they enjoy, but also something that allows them to support themselves and support their future families. And, um, and so we've got to close that gap. And as of today, there's not a plan. And so uh, I, I, I believe that when we roll around in November that the only plan out there is going to be a uh, state question, you know, Seven ninety nine, and the voters of this state will have a decision to make. And uh, because again, um, you know, right now it's just tough. I talked to uh, many, a lot of our viewers know uh, who Kenny Ray is, former football coach here at uh, Punk City. And Kenny and I were having, uh, we were just visiting one afternoon, and his son Tanner teaches in Norman, has been there for about the last, I think, last ten years, and. Uh, Tanner had been up and he was talking to his dad and he was talking to him about the fact that he had had three friends, three of, the, three of his best friends that worked with him in the Norman Public Schools, and they had all left Norman and taken positions in the Dallas area. And every one of them got a $10,000 raise to go two hours south. You know, they can still come to Norman. They're all OU grads. They can still come back to Norman for ball games. They can still do that kind of stuff. But they all left, and you know you you can't I can't blame anybody for that. I can't blame anybody for that, and so we have to figure that out, or we're going to be in a position that I, we're not going to have any more teachers. Um, and uh, you know, even with all the teaching jobs that were eliminated, the state is still having to issue emergency certifications. That means somebody's not quite as qualified as they ought to be. Uh, to teach in the schools in this state. I think we have five or six people on emergency certification that are going to work for us this year. They're good people, but they're not, they don't quite have the credentials that we would have required them to have five years ago. So, um, Another issue you dealt with at the board meeting uh, was wind farms, and I'm sure a lot of people ask, uh, do the school systems 
make any money from all these wind farms yeah. that have popped up all over the state. So wind farms pay, pay property taxes, okay? And uh, for, uh, from the beginning of wind farms until December 31st of 2016, in addition to the federal tax credit that wind farms got and a clean energy tax credit provided by the state of Oklahoma, they also were able to participate in what is known as the Avalorum Reimbursement Fund. And the Avalorum Reimbursement Fund is a state program that if you're a business and you meet certain requirements, either for new construction, expansion, per purchasing of, of equipment, whatever it may be, that you can apply for and receive a five-year exemption from property taxes. Now, the way that works is for that five-year time period, the state of Oklahoma pays your property taxes for you. About two years ago, uh, some groups across the state started, started to look at all the wind farms that were going up. They started to see all the ad valorem dollars that the state was paying on their behalf and they started to basically say, we can't afford this. You know, there's no way that the state is gonna be able to generate enough tax revenue that they can pay all the property taxes for all these wind farms that are projected to be developed. And so two years ago, the state said, we're doing away with the ad valorem tax credit. Uh, they still get huge tax breaks. Uh, one of the reasons that we continue to be in this recession is because we're not collecting any corporate income tax in Oklahoma. And the reason we're not collecting corporate income tax is because of tax credits that companies, wind farms are a big player in this, that they're cashing into the state treasury. So they're taking, they're going in and, and they're pulling money out of the state treasury to, for this tax credit they've earned. Um, so, so they do pay property taxes, but, um, in the near future, K County commissioners are gonna be presented with a proposal uh, from a company called Duke Energy. And uh, Duke is, I don't know, one of the top five largest energy corporations in America. And the, uh, the wind farm that we see going up now, north of Highway 11, Duke Energy is involved in that. So, and kind of the way, that what one company builds the wind farms then another company operates them and sells the electricity is kind of my understanding of how this works. And the Duke people have plans to, uh, to build several more uh, wind farms in this area. The one that uh, we're gonna talk about, that the kind of commissioners are gonna to have to make a decision on here pretty soon is, will be south of Highway 11. So basically when you drive down Highway 11 on your way to I-35, you'll have wind towers on both sides of you. And what Duke Energy has asked the county commissioners to consider is to grant is to create a tax increment financing district for a period of time. And they originally said 20 years, now they're talking about five years. That's called a TIF. And so what a TIF does is what happens is the county will continue to uh, assess the taxes on those wind farms. But rather than that money going to either the school districts where the wind farms are at, to county government, to ambulance service, all the different things that property taxes go to, that money will go into a and this is my paraphrase, I'm sure attorneys would not like this description, but it'll go into a, a TIF fund. And from that fund, then the county commissioners can, can pay things out of that fund. So one of the things that they'll, that if they correct, what Duke wants them to do is Duke wants them to pay them, reimburse them for some of the cost associated with building and operating this wind farm. Basically, they want to not pay property taxes for X number of years. Um, and 
the reason for that is what the Duke people will say is that the wind farm business is very competitive and uh, they, before they even build the wind farm, they have sold the electricity, they entered into a contract. And so if they, if they can't get that tax break for five years, then it's going to cause their electricity that they generate on the new on the new facility will cost more, and so then they won't be able to sell their electricity, so then they won't build the wind farm. So you know it's kind of like you give me five years of a tax break, but then you'll have the tax revenue off of this for the next fifteen years. Now it's it's not as simple as that. It's more complicated than that. Uh, so. Uh, so we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, the well, one thing that's kind of unique about the, the proposal that I think is going to come to the county commissioners is that uh, the wind farms are prim- will primarily be located in the Kildare and the Peckham school district. And obviously, those are schools with very little enrollment. And uh, in, in, in Peckham, which is where the wind farm north of Highway 11 is, they will not be on the state funding formula um, um, after January 1st of 2017 and the reality is uh, they're gonna they're gonna have more funding uh, than I mean they're they're gonna people think about frontier and they talk about frontier and all the money frontiers got um, um, well Peckham will will be another frontier because there's because they have such a small student body right at 100 students and the same name with Kildare uh, they're going to have lots of general fund wealth with a very small student body. I think there's 70 kids out of Kildare. So one of the things that the, that the developer of this TIF proposal is looking at is on this development that's south of Highway 11 is rather than that money going to Kildare and Peckham, because what, the, what they're what so here's another part of this. So so what they can do is out of that TIF they can they, they don't have they can give they can give some money to Duke. But they can also take some money for the county commissioners to use, and they can give some of the money back to school districts. But if they give it back to school districts, it does not go through the state funding formula. So it's kind of like kind of like federal money in that way. And so uh, one of the proposals is is to take a percentage of that money, and I don't know if it's going to be, you know, forty percent of the property taxes that would be paid to school districts, or fifty percent, or sixty, whatever it is, is to take that money and to distribute it to Blackwell and Newkirk schools. Um, because, and I'm not, I'm, I mean, I think probably when the, when, the, when the guys, when the people looked at that who developed the TIF, they saw Newkirk and Blackwell as being the closest school districts to where the wind farms are going to be built. So that seemed to them to be the logical place for the money to go if it wasn't going to go to Peckham and, and Kildare. Um, I mean, obviously that helps Blackwell and and Newkirk get excited about maybe this project coming to play, even though Blackwell has lots of wind farm money already. So, uh, so that's a little bit different. Uh, one of the things that uh, that I'm going to advocate for is that if they're if the money's not if they're going to take some money out of the TIF and they're going to use it send it to schools, then it ought to be distributed on a countywide basis. Um, it shouldn't just go to two districts. We all ought to get a part of it. Um, if they're going to do that. And so the, the reason I talked to the board about it, Phil, and the reason I'm talking about it today is that sometimes in the city, you know, we live in Punk City, we don't think about the county commissioners and we don't think about what they do, but the reality is that, that they do represent us. Uh, Vance Johnson is the, uh, is the, kind of represents the Punk City area. And, uh, and so I would just encourage you to think about this. I mean, you know, here, here's what I, here's what I, I told the, the, commi- the county commissioner, you know, I don't know when this stops. If you give a TIF to Duke Energy to build wind farms, uh, what if somebody else in the county wants to drill an oil well? Why don't you give a TIF for that oil well? You know, where do you stop? Um, the wind farm industry is probably the most incentivized energy industry in the country right now. The amount of tax breaks they get from the, in our case, from the state and federal government are huge, uh, and 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 I and I'm sure from the business side of this, they they, they see those tax breaks as being necessary 
than they're operated. It is more expensive to create wind power than it is to create natural gas or those kinds of things. And as Oklahomans, if we have more wind farms go up, are we helping the price of natural gas stay low, which affects state budget? There's lots of big issues uh, that we have to consider as a state and as the county's got to consider. So now, you know, the other part of me is this, if, uh, if somehow the decision's made, if the proposal ends up being that we're gonna take this money and we're gonna distribute a percentage of it to all districts in the county, well then, you know, I have to sit back and go, okay, how's this gonna affect Ponca City? And it's because, you know, we're not any different than the other school district in Oklahoma, we're all desperate for revenue. Um, you know, the other thing is, is about stuff like this, schemes like these, and it's a scheme undermine the state funding formula the end of the day, they hurt every school district in Oklahoma, and especially if this becomes widespread. Um, because uh, if if you have a situation where they're doing a shopping center in Oklahoma City, and that's going into a TIF, and the school districts get money from that, but that's not going into the state funding formula, then that hurts all of us. So, you know, there's lots of big issues here. Uh, and the biggest question is, you know, if, if they don't get the TIF, does Duke still, does the wind farm still go up mm -hmm. and we don't and we don't know that does somebody else operate it the energy does not stay in the Oklahoma, state of Oklahoma it all goes out of state and then the other big issue that's in the future for our state is they got to build some transmission lines to get this stuff out of here and I just read an article last week that there's they've done a, I forget now how many wind farms they've done in West Texas and they were supposed to build this big transmission line that was going to take the power to Dallas and Houston and San Antonio and Austin but the power lines not been completed yet and so uh, they have energy they can't really dispose of so it's an interesting dilemma you know as we try to move forward and try to figure all this out and um, you know county commissioners have got a big decision to make um, and i think you know every citizen in k county needs to let them know what they think and and the other part of this is, you know, it's easy to sit here and say, well, you know, you ought to pay your taxes, you shouldn't get a tax break. I think we also have to remember that that there that that there are landowners involved in this, and there are there are individuals who, you know, because of that tower on their property, uh, they're gonna generate thousands of dollars of income for their for their for their farming operation. And and you know, I'm sure if 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 I if I had you know, if I had three wind towers getting ready to put on my property, I promise you I'd be lobbying the commissioners about how much we needed to do that. So there's lots of things going on here, lots of moving parts, and and uh, they're going to have to be wise, and and um, and we'll have to see what happens. But I, again, more than anything else, I want people to understand that uh, that this is a serious issue. That I think I think whatever happens in K County will be what's copied across the state of Oklahoma. If we, if we, if our county commissioners say yes, and I think commissioners in Grant, Grant County and in Beaver County and all across the Panhandle and Southern Oklahoma, uh, they're all going to be, they're, they're all going to say yes, and we're going to take. There are going to be millions and millions of dollars of revenue that should be going through the state funding formula. That at least for the first five years of those projects will not go through those formulas. And the other part of this is, is that the wind farm value deteriorates quickly over time. Uh, they have about a 25 year lifespan. So if you, if you give a TIF for five years, the, most, the five most productive years from a property tax standpoint are those wind farms. They're not, those, nobody, the school districts, county government, uh, county agencies aren't getting any revenue from that. So, I mean, it's a, it's a big decision, you know. We'll ask one more thing and then we'll let you go because I know it's a busy time for our schools and I actually know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, first day of school, unless something unusual happens, uh, have you mapped out David Pennington's day that day? Because I know you try to be in several different places at one time. Yeah, I'm going to start my day at Washington at the pre-K center. Uh, and then from there, we'll probably do trout. Uh, then Woodlands will t kind of take the north uh, east part of the district first and then work our way through i try to stay out of the high school uh -huh. you know because it's just kind of it's just kind of wild there but, but yeah we're going to go to the 4k center uh, give them a chance to we're not we're going to actually give them a, you know, that's going to be a you know i mean you talk about uh, something that somebody needs to video is 
taking uh, 354 year olds and trying to get them out of cars and into a building the first day. It's going to be a little, you know, now that I think about it, I may not go to the 4K Center in the <laughs> afternoon. I might wait till after lunch before I go over and see how things are going over there. But the word is chaos. Uh, it, it'll it'll be interesting. And yeah. you know what? It'll it'll be for for a week or so. But you know what? After that first week, it'll work. It'll run just like clockwork. And we remind people right there by Washington, the pre-K, uh, there's a school zone that's kind of, it's not hidden, but it's not as well marked as a lot of them. So uh, they're between anywhere from 5th to ninth on Highland. You really need to watch your speed. Yeah. Yeah. In, or fact, Hartford, I in say. fact, if I didn't have a reason to be on, uh, on 7th Street starting Wednesday, August 17th until the last day of school, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. I mean, you have high school kids driving to school. You've got uh, you've got Washington traffic, and you've got uh, and you've got Roosevelt traffic, really. So there's lots of traffic on Seventh Street, and you know, which is the way it used to be, right? Until we closed Washington about eight or nine years ago. So, you know, we're just again, it's just interesting how things kind of go around. Absolutely outstanding. Good luck, and uh, watch the school zones. School starts on August 17th. For Dr. Pennington and Chris Adams, I'm Phil Turner.